in a world where jobs are how most people make money. One man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is the show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes or Apple Podcasts, type in Old Dogs, spelled D A W G S. Find our podcast and subscribe. Well, I am totally stoked about today's show because this is like one of my favorite. To, and I can't say my favorite, but I can say one of my favorite. You know, then I won't offend anybody. But one of my favorite guests that we have on uh, just a young pup who puts uh, some of us old dogs to shame here because she has just really mastered a number of things uh, from personal finance to to real estate to I mean writing books and well let me just tell you who we have here it's Rachel Richards and uh, I'm sure you remember her from uh, our first show and she was on our uh, what would you do with a million dollar uh, podcast that we had um, she at the age of 27 quit her job and retired that's right 27 years old she is now living off over 20,000 per month in passive income she is the best-selling author of money honey and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement, two books that are doing amazing on uh, Amazon and, and wherever books are sold. Uh, she built a real estate portfolio of 38 rental units by the age of 26. She's a former financial advisor and has been featured on uh, CNN and Business Insider. She makes the topic of money management fun, entertaining, and simple for her 250,000 plus millennial followers. Wow. And Rachel helps women feel excited, capable, and confident with their financial future. Future, and my daughters can attest to that. Rachel has a Bachelor of Science in Financial Economics from Center College. She has held roles as financial advisor, real estate analyst, and senior finance analyst. And she is based in Colorado, where she lives with her husband and her dog, Chloe. So, Rachel, welcome to, back to the Old Dogs REI Network. Hey, Bill. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It's so fun to be back. Oh, it's always a blast to have you on. You uh, have such a great perspective and what a wonderful attitude. And uh, it's just uh, very contagious. It's fun to have people on that, that enjoy what they do and can present you know, just the, you know, even the topic, you know, the maybe a little technical stuff in such a way that makes it uh, easy to understand and comprehend. You know, we talked uh, last time you were on, you talked to us about uh, what you would do if you just got a check for a million dollars in the mail. And um, so I'm going to encourage people to, I'll have a link to that show so you can find out what Rachel's answer was. Uh, while we were talking after the show, um, she mentioned that she is making a transition in her real estate investing that I thought would be really, really valuable to people that listen because it... Um, it's a, a, a something that a lot of old dogs I'm talking to are, are doing. 
Rachel, uh, well, just bring us up to date, you know, what you've been up to lately. I, I know you had a, a terrible weekend skiing in Vail. That's uh, so sad. <laughs> you had to go through that. And uh, <laughs> what else have you been up to? Yeah. Uh, so this year we have transitioned our real estate portfolio a lot. And as you said in my bio, we, my husband and I built a real estate portfolio of 38 rental units. So it was six buildings, 38 doors at a pretty young age. Um, and now I always clarify for the audience cause I get asked this a lot and I always clarify, I'm not a trust fund baby and I never made six figures from a job or career. So we, we, you you all have to listen to the first episode that Bill and I did to kind of hear the story of, of how we did that. But I always clarify those couple of things, but we had this massive real estate portfolio and this year we decided to sell, or I guess it was last year, 2021, we decided to sell off a lot of those units. We sold three of our largest buildings. It was 34 units total. And we made the decision to transition a lot of those profits and a lot of that equity into real estate syndications instead, which is something I'm really excited to invest heavily in going forward. That is so exciting. And and I think that's something that a lot of people can uh, relate to that have been in real estate for a while. And even if you've got the, the best properties out there, um, there, there, there's still things that are required um, of you as the owner, whether you have you know great property management or not. Um, it, it, it does, it does kind of take away. Maybe you can share a little bit of you know why you decided to let go of those uh, properties. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I always tell people that re owning real estate is not passive unless you have a property manager right? Chances are you don't want to quit your full-time job to become a full-time landlord. So you really have to have a property manager in place so that it is passive income. And even with a property manager, there's always going to be an aspect of manage the manager. So it's not fully 100% passive. However, it's a lot more passive than a nine to five job. So there were a few reasons we decided to sell these houses. Now, these three big houses we sold last year, we were operating as rent by the room houses. It was definitely a, a unique model. It was affordable housing. It was a flat rate rent by the room. Um, tenants shared common areas like kitchens and bathrooms. And it was a win-win. For us, you could take a normal building and turn it into a cash cow. And for the tenants, we were offering affordable housing, which is really needed in a lot of cities. And these were all in Louisville, Kentucky, by the way. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so, so we decided to sell these for a few reasons. Um, first of all, last year, as you know, it ended up being a great time to sell with the market. We made out really well. Um, I market all of these privately and I did for sale by owner, so I didn't have to pay any realtor commission. So we sold at a high price. We profited really well. Um, number two reason is for peace of mind. I was always stressed out about these boarding houses and these tenants being in such close quarters. A tenant had set fire recently to a kitchen. And even though we had all the protections in place, right, we had LLCs, we had an umbrella policy, we had all the insurance. I didn't want the liability anymore, and I wanted the peace of mind of not owning these anymore. So there was that. And then the third reason, and really the main reason, is I kind of view real estate investing as a time versus money trade-off. The journey of real estate investing, time versus money trade-off. When my husband and I started investing, we were broke. We didn't have a lot of money. We were willing to do everything we could to have a, put a lot of effort into it and invest our time and work really hard so we can make a lot of money early on. And that's why we were willing to purchase these boarding houses and operating operate them as rent by the room and make a lot of money. Now, later on in our journey, as we accumulate more money, we prioritize our time more and more. We want true passive income, and now we are plan planning on transitioning this money into real estate syndications and other investments that are even more passive. So again, th those properties served us very well when we were hustling and building our empire, and they just don't align with our goals anymore because we prioritize and value our time so much more now. So we are willing to invest into syndications 
and earn a little bit less money, but it's something that's truly passive at this point. So that's really the third reason. Gotcha. Great, great explanation. Um, uh, curious, why a for sale by owner? I mean, obviously the financial, but um, w- weren't you a little concerned about you know making sure you had all the legalities and everything in place? Yeah. And so here's the thing. I'm a real estate agent. So I'm a licensed. Oh, you are. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a licensed real estate agent in Kentucky, um, which also does does mean that I, I didn't earn a commission myself, but I saved money by not having to pay a commission to another real estate agent. So I did feel comfortable representing myself just because I do have the background. I have the certification um, and we did use an attorney to write up the contract. So it's not like we did the legal part on our own. We the buyer hired an attorney. We hired our own attorney. So we felt very comfortable doing that all on our own. Okay, got it. Yeah, I didn't realize that you were an agent. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and, and these were actual apartments too, right? One was a duplex, one was a triplex, one was a quad. But they because they were rent by the room, we didn't have two or three or four tenants. We had 10 or 11 or 12 tenants because there were 10 or 11 or 12 buildings in each one or 12 rooms in each building. Got it. Got it. Now, was this um, campus type housing or just just uh, general, just um, lower cost, you know, boarding room type housing? Just a normal, just a normal quad, what you would envision as a normal triplex or quad. So four units, you know, with each one has its own kitchen and maybe one or two bathrooms in each unit. So each tenant would have their own private bedroom okay. in that unit. Got, got yeah, it. and then they would share kitchens and bathrooms. We would fully furnish everything. We would pay for all of the utilities, even the Wi-Fi. We would provide a TV. We'd provide everything. And then the tenant could just move in, wouldn't have to worry about anything, and they would pay us a flat weekly fee. So it was very much affordable housing. And these boarding houses were huge. It wasn't a small duplex. It was a 3,500 square foot duplex or a 4,500 square foot quad. So they were very big. And, and why did you um, go weekly on the, on the rent? I mean, I, I know that definitely would help uh, for folks that, you know, have limited funds. Um, um, it, was that primarily the, the appeal there? It was, we found these properties on the MLS, which is remarkable because to find such a good deal on the MLS these days is, is very rare. We found this on the MLS in 2017, the first one, and the prior owners had been operating it this way. To to us, it was brilliant. We hadn't ever seen a rent-by-the-room house that was operating this way. Everything looked great. The cash, I mean, the cash flow numbers were unreal. To give you an idea, this the first building was a quad. It was listed for 450 grand. And for those of you listening that are familiar with the one percent rule. A four hundred fifty thousand dollar house should be renting for forty five hundred dollars a month. On the MLS listing, this property said it was renting for something like seventy. I think it was seventy five hundred a month. So wow. when I saw that, I was like, "Is this a typo? Is <laughs> is this a mistake? What's going on?" So of course, my husband and I went down to look immediately, and it was very unique. You know, it was going to take a, a, a unique buyer, the right buyer, to buy something like this because it was a lot of work. It was not easy managing these, and we self managed them for a long time. So we bought them, um, and it was just a cash cow. It, it worked very well, and so our thought was. They clearly were operating this in a very profitable way, and we just wanted to do the same thing, right? Why mess with something that works? So we continued to do it exactly the way that they were operating it before. And um, now you you have others that are sort of standard one-year leases as well, other properties, right? Yes. Um, uh, yes. How how does the weekly rental compare with um, with your yeah, I mean, do you find people's, you know, there's more turnaround or do they actually stay longer? There's more turnaround, but I would say a typical tenant in those buildings stayed about six months. So it's not like they were, we had tenants leave, you know, staying there once a week or for two weeks. Um, we had a minimum lease agreement of 12 weeks. So they had okay. to stay for at least 12 weeks. So it wasn't a short term rental. So we were abiding by, it was a long-term rental technically, but most of our tenants stayed about six months and we had some that stayed for several years. That's amazing. And that, that one house that uh, was 7,500 a month, it, it was at how many actual, 
Now, these are all individual rooms, or, or mm -hmm. are you actually splitting up rooms too? No, all individual rooms. Each tenant had their own room. Okay, so you, how many actual rooms did you have in that, that uh, building? I think that one was 12. 12, okay, well, got it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that is, that is really interesting. Um, and you were self-managing for a while, right? Yes, and it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work. So that one, we self-managed. And keep in mind, we were doing this around full-time jobs, and I was writing my books in the evenings. So for a while, we were working 80-hour weeks, both of us, to make to make our dreams come true. Um, there was <laughs> yeah. a lot of sacrifice. <laughs> and are you uh, on a track uh, to eventually liquidate all of your properties, or do you think you're going to hold on to a certain percentage or certain you know, a certain group of properties. No, we, we sold the three buildings. We sold the three bigger boarding houses last year. We are definitely going to keep our three other houses, which we have two single family and one duplex still in Kentucky. And all of the other money that we made from selling the three boarding houses, we're now reinvesting in, into syndications. So we do still want to be heavily invested into real estate and now that we live in Denver, Colorado, we are looking to invest here as well. But if we invest here, it will be passively. It'll be more as a silent partner or a long-term rental. We won't be doing the boarding house style again. Right. Now, with um, this this shift as indications, now it's it's kind of a whole different ball game here for you, I'm sure. Um, whereas before you pretty well controlled the show. Now you have to find people that you feel confident will be able to, you know, manage properly and be able to uh, achieve the goals that they set out. Um, how has that process been in terms of um, hunting down the, you know, the, the, the really good syndication deals out there? Quite a learning process. <laughs> um, just like when you start off with real estate investing, you don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> um, that's how I felt with syndications at first. So let, let me back up and explain what a syndication is for those that might not be sure. familiar. Um, so a syndication, so let's say an investor finds a $10 million apartment complex and they can't afford to buy that on their own. They can form a syndication and raise money from private investors, people like you and me, and we can invest in this syndication. So they're they're raising funds from us. When we invest in the syndication, we're not just lending them our money and earning interest. We are actually equity owners in this apartment complex, which means we are entitled to a share of the profits. So when we invest as a limited partner, we can earn a quarterly or a monthly distribution. So we earn part of the cash flow as a distribution, and we're entitled to a share of the profits if the apartment complex is ever refinanced or if it's ever sold. So that's how you earn money investing in a syndication. It's very, very passive. This is the most passive way I've ever found to directly own real estate. Because again, you're an equity owner in the apartment complex you have all the same tax benefits as you would if you went out and bought your own rental property. So you get uh, depreciation, you get the same form, you get a K-1, so you get all the tax benefits, um, you get a share of the profits and everything. It's really great. Once you do the due diligence of finding a syndicator, analyzing the syndication, you send your money in, that's all you do. You don't have to manage the tenants or oversee the renovations because the syndication team is doing all that. Once you send your money in, you sit back and you don't do anything else. You just collect your money. So it's it's true mailbox money, and it's something to me that's very, very attractive. Now, the reason we couldn't do this starting out, there are two reasons. First of all, a lot of syndications, you have to be an accredited investor to invest in them, which we were not starting out. And then a lot of syndications require a minimum investment of 50 or 75 or 100K to invest in them, which again, we did not have that kind of money starting out. So this is something that we are able to do now later on in our journey. Um, so that's, ju that's just to explain what, what they are. So Bill, what was your original question? Cause now I forgot. <laughs> I know, it's okay. I, I, you actually have got, I've got some new questions for you here. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. I kind of jumped into a little bit too much on that too. I think it was great how you took a step back. Um, uh, maybe you can even, even explain what, uh, an accredited investor is for those that don't know. Oh, sure. So you can qualify to be an accredited investor 
one of two ways, either through your net worth or through your income. So your net worth needs to be at least $1 million excluding your primary residence or your income, I believe, and, and don't quote me on this, but I believe it has to be at least $200,000 for the past two years if you're single or $300,000 for the past two years if you're married. Yeah, that's that. That is correct. Yes. Got it. Okay, that's it. Okay, great. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, that's great. Now, okay, so you're you're ready to make this change. I mean, it is a really really neat thing because you, um, yeah, you you, you can make more on your own, but you can also <laughs> make less um, uh, too. You know, where you're not having to worry about all the broken pipes or whatever may happen. I mean, you you you're going to get your return. Um, hopefully regardless. And, um, what, what kind of returns are you seeing out there now? You're, you're currently looking still, or are you all done, uh, uh you know, uh, finding syndications, uh, sort of where are you at in that process? A little bit of both. We have invested in eight syndications so far, and we're wanting to invest in at least five more this year, if not more than that. Um, so it's an ongoing process. Now, as far as the returns, Here's the thing. Syndicators can provide you with a deck. So they give you an investment deck, which is basically a 30 page analysis and all these fancy pictures and all these fancy tables of how the syndication looks and all their projections. And here's the thing. They can make it project whatever they want it to. They can make it say, oh, this investment's going to give you back 15%. Or 20%, right? It's just a projection. So they it can say whatever they want it to say. So that's what you have to keep in mind, um, which is why when they give you their investment deck and you look at it, you really kind of need to do your own due diligence and double check their numbers and, and look at it from your own perspective. So just keep that in mind. A lot of these syndications project in the mid-teens from an IRR or an ROI perspective. So 13 to 17% is pretty common. Um, and that's including the cash flow and the profit on sale is what I've seen. Now, I only started investing in syndications in 2020. So I'm, I'm new to it enough where I can't say with any certainty what the syndications are returning so far. Another thing you want to keep in mind is that when you first invest into a syndication, you often don't get your first check or your first distribution for six to 12 months after you've sent in your money. That's very common. That's nothing to be alarmed about. That's not a red flag. That's just very common. That's how it works. So I have received regular distributions. They've all looked how they were supposed to look, but I won't know for sure until we've exited the deal. A normal syndication can have a timeline of three, five, seven, ten 10 years. So again, I'm not going to know for several more years if the deal has performed the way it's said it's going to perform. But so far on all of mine, they look to be performing as they are supposed to be performing, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, and um, also, you, you know, you have sponsors um, or operators that will um, quote you. Uh, this will be your your annual, uh, um, you know, income that you're going to get. And then they'll, they'll give you a, a percentage for that. And then they'll give you another percentage for IRR. Uh, are, yes. are, um, what what are you getting or what does it seem like you're getting uh, in the you know just just the uh, the monthly or quarterly uh, for each year um it all depends and some syndications will set a preferred return so they might say you're going to get a preferred return of eight percent per year in cash flow and so you can expect that other syndications won't do that and they'll say um, you know, the cash flow might be start off lower and then get higher in later years. So it might be 3% in the first year and then 5% in the second year and then seven and then 12 and then 15. So it kind of depends. But what I expect is that my cash flow will continue to get higher and higher, um, as, as more years pass. even if I don't invest in more syndications, my cash flow is going to get higher. So I think the last time I checked, I'm, I'm earning about $1,400 a month in distributions right now. And that was based off of seven syndications I'm invested in. Um, so I don't have the math or the numbers on me right now, but I'm currently earning 1400 a month in cash flow. Gotcha. On seven syndications. 
And um, do uh, with the you know you and your husband do you set your own criteria then in terms of okay we we really want monthly distributions or we we don't really care if we're going to take monthly or quarterly. Um, do, you know, we want to make at least a minimum of this percentage. I mean, how, how do you sort of sort them out as you're looking at these various syndications? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. We look for uh, syndications that are in one of three areas, multifamily, self-storage, and mobile home parks. I believe mobile home parks and self-storage are a great place to be invested right now because I think it's a supply and demand thing. There's not enough self-storage. There's not enough mobile heart, mobile home parks. Um, multifamily is just one that I feel very, very comfortable analyzing because I've owned multifamily. So from an analysis perspective, I know what looks good and what doesn't look good. So we're focused on those three areas, but there's you can syndicate anything. So you can syndicate an industrial business, um, an office complex, a shopping mall, you can syndicate any kind of real estate. So you want to figure out what kind of syndication do you want to invest in? Another thing we look for is a shorter time horizon. We want to get our capital back as quickly as possible because that lowers our risk. If the, if we're not going to get our capital back for 10 years, that feels risky to us. We'd rather see that there's a refinance event or a sale in year three or five, and we're gonna get our money back a lot faster. Also, we don't invest in syndications that don't cash flow. So there are some syndications that are uh, construction builds, they're, they're developments, things that aren't cash flowing right now, but you invest in it and they're gonna build it and construct it and then sell it, and then you make all your money back when it sells. That feels too risky for me. I want something that's proven to cash flow right now that I can invest in. So we only invest in cash flowing assets. Um, and then the big thing for us is that we are looking for a good syndicator, right? Because again, they can make the projections say whatever they want, but the syndicator herself or himself needs to have knowledge, experience. They need to clearly know what they're doing. And you really need to do just as much due diligence on the syndicator as the syndication itself. I've heard of so many stories of people wiring in 50 grand to some syndicator who is not a legitimate syndicator and the syndicator just runs off with people's money and spends it. And it's just a scam. And yeah, the syndicator ends up in jail, but investors typically don't have a way of recovering their money. So you don't want to get scammed. It's very easy to get scammed in things like this. Um, it's very important that when you're looking for a syndicator, you are personally introduced through somebody you know, through a mutual friend, a mutual connection, somebody who has invested with them before who can speak for them. And if anybody listening wants an introduction, I'm happy to make introductions for you all for syndicators that I've invested with. But you know, don't just invest with somebody on Facebook or somebody on LinkedIn that, that reaches out. So that's definitely my biggest piece of advice is, is really vetting the syndicators that you're investing with. And in that process too, um, and even getting a referral, cause you know, unfortunately, you know, there are folks that, you know, oh, this guy's great. He's, you know, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden he's not so great for you. Um, what, um, you know, do you, how are you trying to find or maybe broaden your network a little bit so that you are getting um, some good qualified uh, folks to to investigate and to, and, to, and to dig a little deeper into? I'm asking my network. So I'm asking other real estate investors. I'm asking podcast hosts like you, you know, other podcast hosts I've been on. Hey, are you investing in syndications? If so, which ones have you really liked? Um, which ones do you know and do you trust so far that you've invested with? Which ones have been impressive to you? So I've just asked in my network, and that's the best way. Um, I have not invested with somebody that I have not personally been introduced to. Um, are, are you investing? Or I, I imagine, I mean, you're you're on a lot of podcasts. You're you're out there in in uh, this world. <laughs> I mean, do, are, are there some that are you know personal friends or people that you've known for a period of time? No, I haven't invested with personal friends. Um, and I don't really know anyone personally that's, I guess there are a few people, but I haven't done that yet. And there's no reason I wouldn't. 
Um, but you know, I do want to make sure somebody has a lot of experience doing a syndication. I, I would not invest with somebody if it was their first or second or third syndication that they were forming. I would want to see that they've not only done several syndications, but that they've exited several syndications. And normally for them to actually form and then exit a syndication could mean that they have to have been in the business for at least five years and they have several under their belt. So they do need to have significant experience for me to invest with them. That's great. Now you mentioned um, that you know there is a range of how much you can invest. Um, I, I mean, I know some syndicators will take to, as as low as twenty five thousand. I haven't heard of anything less than that, but I imagine they could. But uh, I don't think it's worth it, you know, for a lot of syndicators because it's you know it's it's just a lot more people to keep track of. But um, have you you know looked at a certain um, you know, is that a factor in terms of, you know, whether it's 25, 50 or a hundred, um, or is it just really just depend on the deal? Yeah, that's a great question, Bill. It's definitely a factor for me. I have not invested over 50 K on a deal. And if their minimum is a hundred K, I don't feel comfortable investing that amount. Cause to me, it's about diversification as well. I'd rather have 25 K invested into four deals than 100K invested in one deal. Because just like with any investment, you can lose all your money, right? There's risk here. With anything you invest, you can lose all of your money. So with every, I think out of this, the eight we've invested in, we've invested 25K in seven of them and 50K in one of them, I think. So, um, and here's the thing too, a lot of them that have minimums of 50K or 75K or 100K, you can ask them, hey, would you be willing to lower your minimum for me? And so on nearly all of these, their minimum was not 25K. Their minimum might have been 50K. And so what I do is I approach the syndicator and I say, hey, I know your minimum is 50K. I really would like to invest with you on this deal. Would you be willing to lower your minimum to 25K for me? You know, if this goes well, I could see myself doing a lot more deals with you. You know, would you be willing to lower it? I... I have yet to have a syndicator say no to that. So don't be afraid to ask for them to lower their minimum because most of the time they will say yes. Great point. Great point. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, are are you are you familiar with the five hundred six B five hundred six C distinction? Um, yes, accredited versus non accredited. Right. Um, are you only going into accredited deals, um, or do you, you do, does it matter to you? It doesn't matter to me. I'm going into either one of them. So I'm invested in both. I forget which one is which, but five, I think 506B is open to non-accredited. Is that right? Right, right. Okay. And then 506C deals are only open to accredited investors. So for those of you listening, just make sure you pay attention to what kind of deal it is. Um, and on that note, one of the reasons you don't hear about syndication deals or you don't hear from syndicators is that they can't legally advertise these because they're governed by the SEC. Well, that, yeah, that's actually uh, just the 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 one for syndicated folks. Um, the I believe, yeah, the other you can actually advertise, um, and um, that uh, so so that you know that that the, the, that'd be something. For example, you know, we've had people on on my show that um, have a syndication; they cannot promote it if it's a you know 506 b um but uh on a 506 c um they you know they could say yeah you can go to this website and find out all about it so yeah uh, so it has to do with whether it's the accredited one or non-accredited one right right right. okay yeah so um so that's why forever i was like why haven't i heard of syndications before and it's because depending on the type they can't advertise it but yeah i invest in both it doesn't really matter to me um, but yeah, if, if you're not accredited, just make sure you pay attention to what type it is. Right, right. And and you're, um, you know, kind of sticking the 25, I would assume probably just to diversify, right, is to not have too much in any one deal until you start seeing, you know, which which folks you're going to stay with and maybe increase your your investment. Exactly. Yep. I've done 25 so far. The one I did 50 on, I just, I saw the deal and I, I just knew it was a great deal. Everything looked so good. I did the numbers. I did all the due diligence 
And I was like, I'm going to do more on this one because I, I just thought it was an amazing deal. And I, I had already invested with the syndicator in a different deal. So this would have been my second deal with him, already knew him, already trusted him. So um, that was why I went up on that one. And as I get more comfortable and more confident and I do more and more deals, I might do 50. But again, I would just rather have my money spread out over a lot of different deals, just like in the stock market when you invest in an index fund instead of investing in individual stocks. It's kind of the same concept. Right, right. Yeah, and one thing that's you know really changed a lot, I mean, since uh, 20, 2016, 2017, uh, there were a lot of deals out there that were very short term. And, uh, you know, there were some that would, uh, it would just take two years because uh, prices were going up so radically that, uh, you know, they could make tremendous return in just a couple of years. Um, you know, the three to fives, you know, was was pretty common but i'm i'm seeing more and more you know five to seven seven to ten even um uh, are you are you finding that too that the shorter term ones are are more difficult to to find yeah i see a mix and i wasn't really looking at them back in 2017 2018 because it wasn't on my radar and i wouldn't have been able to invest in it anyways um but i do see a mix it's definitely hard to find a three-year syndication i would say Five year is more common, and I do see more that are seven and ten. But I would say it's it's not hard to find a five year turnaround. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, are and you haven't held held any yet, obviously, to be able to go through the whole process, right? Where the, right. the sale and so forth. Uh, are you finding that you know just kind of monitoring your your returns, uh, certain asset classes are giving better returns. I mean, you mentioned mobile home parks, self-storage and multifamily. Um, uh, you know, I've heard certain things about, you know, those different groups. Uh, are you seeing better returns in a certain asset class? Um, no, because it's too early in my investments to be able to tell and to be able to compare. Um, cause I've only been receiving distributions for a year or two. Now, the one that's unique that I've invested in is a laundromat and that's been giving me really good returns. A so laundromat. The, yeah. <laughs> um, wow. I know that was actually the first syndication we did, which is so random, but Andrew and I had always been interested in owning a laundromat cause it was such a unique passive income stream. And we came across this syndication. It's actually in California. Well, the cool thing about a laundromat is that you don't have to worry about tenants. So there's no evictions and there's no risk of having a non-paying tenant. So it's kind of a different passive income stream. Um, I think our return on that one so far has been about 13%. That's great. And that's not including, you know, that's not that's not including any refinance or sale event that would happen later. So that's a really strong cash flow return so far. Um I do think this one that I invested 50K in, which is the mobile home park that, that I did, is going to have a really strong return. But again, it's too early to tell, and every syndication is different. Yeah, I haven't done mobile home parks, but um, everyone I know that does them gets great returns. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that's what, one reason I was asking. I was wondering if you had experienced that yet. But uh, um, And uh, you know who's going big into that is uh, Brandon Turner um, uh, yes. in the mobile home. and. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's really, that's fa fascinating. A, a, a laundromat. Wow. <laughs> have, have you looked at other commercial type things like triple net, uh, industrial warehouse? Uh, uh you know, some of those are, are pretty hot. Uh, you know, others, I, I wouldn't touch office buildings right now personally, but, uh, um, but there are some that are actually going in there and repurposing them. I know one guy I you know just interviewed that uh, took an office building and converted it into a multifamily, and uh, uh, with an amazing return, he got all kinds. Of, it was in an opportunity zone, and Pace mm -hmm. funds were used, and all this other stuff. It just uh, he just crushed it on that one. But uh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, another one we did was a industrial syndication. And here's the thing, I'm not even comfortable speaking about it, and not that I won't speak about it, but I here I don't fully understand it, which is not good. You you never invest in something you don't fully understand. <laughs> don't do as I do. Right. Don't, <laughs> as I say, not as I do. Um, I spent hours and hours and hours doing due diligence on this, but I've never invested in industrial or commercial. I've only invested in multifamily residential before, and I have enough understanding to analyze self-storage and mobile home parks and multifamily, 
But that's why now after having invested in that, I'm like, I'm not going to invest in another industrial because I don't understand triple net lease, right? So it's, stick to what you know, you're going to, jack of all trades is a master of none, right? Mm -hmm. So here, the syndication is performing great. I'm receiving all my money. It's, it's going great, but I shouldn't have done that. So learn from my mistakes, you all. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it won't be a mistake. Hopefully it was a, it was a yeah. good, you know, it was a risk, you know, and, and there's always risk involved, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so um, okay, so you you know you've been buying multifamily for years. Um, you know about due diligence as it pertains to apartment buildings, multifamily that you've that you've purchased before. But how did your your shift in due diligence um, happen with you? I mean, you obviously there's a, there's a lot of different things you have to look at um, uh, when mm -hmm. you're investing in a syndication. Um, how did you sort of get ramp up and get educated and uh to to do that okay there's a lot i can say here so first of all there's a book that is amazing it's called the hands-off investor by brian burke it's a bigger pockets book book uh it's very technical but if you read that book you'll be like an expert on investing in syndication so i definitely recommend reading that in terms of doing due diligence there's sort of two stages of due diligence when you network or first connect with a syndicator, they absolutely should ask to meet with you and have a call with you because they're not supposed to advertise to you unless they, they know you. Um, so if they're not, and even so, even if not, they, they should be wanting to learn about you and to learn about your goals. So if I meet with somebody and they put me on their deal list that they start sending me deals without wanting to connect with me first, I, I kind of think it's a red flag. So the first stage of due diligence is meeting with the syndicator and sort of interviewing them, right? They're, they want to know you too. They're going to ask you about your goals, but you can have a list of questions to ask them as well. You can ask them, um, what kind of syndications have you done? How much money have you raised in the past? How many deals have you exited? How many of your exited deals underperformed compared to projections? Why did they underperform? What did you learn? Have your investors ever lost money? Can you send me financials for any of your current deals? Um, what else? How, how has COVID impacted your current investments? How did you manage through COVID? Who manages investor relations on your team, right? So there's all sorts of questions you can ask the sponsors or the syndicators. And then after you get to know them, you feel comfortable with them, they'll put you on their deal flow list, which just means they're going to email you a, a potential syndication opportunity anytime they have one that comes up. Then when you see a syndication that you like, you can start looking at it, start analyzing it, and then make a list of questions. And so this is my process, by the way. This isn't the process. This is just what I do. I'm very thorough. I'm very conservative and I'm very thorough. So then I will analyze the syndication. I'll write out a bunch of questions about the specific deal. And before investing, I'll get on another call with the syndicator and I'll go through a list of like 20 questions about the specific syndication. And here's another thing. If you, if the, if the syndicator is not showing a willingness to educate you and answer your questions, it's another red flag because they should be giving you all the time that you want for you to get your questions answered. You are about to send them 25 grand or 50 grand. That's a lot of money. You're placing a lot of trust in them and they should absolutely give you the time of day and not make you feel like they are impatient or that they don't have time for you. So I'll do, I'll ask a ton of questions about the deal. You know, what do you see as the greatest risk of this investment? What happens if you don't raise the funds needed to close? Have you walked every single unit in this investment? What is the break-even occupancy? When does this close? When will you send out the first distributions? How often will you send out distributions? How much of your own money are you investing? So those, that's a lot, but those are just a few examples of some of the questions that I will ask. So when you're assessing a syndication, what percentage of importance in that, in that process would you say the operator slash sponsor is, you know, compared to all the other things that you look at? I spend more time doing due diligence on the operator or syndicator than the actual investment itself. 
So if you're going to spend five hours looking at a deal, spend three to four hours looking at the syndicator and spend one to two hours looking at the deal. That's great. Great advice. Do you do background checks? Yeah, I don't do them, but I'll, I'll say, Hey, have you done a background check for everyone on your team? And can you send that to me? Great. Great. Now, a lot of syndicators, and you've probably seen this as you're, you're looking for new potential opportunities, uh, have moved into generating and creating funds um, that, you mm -hmm. know, funds that they'll use to buy maybe one project or multiple projects. Um, have you looked at funds? And, and if so, what, what, what's your, your opinion on them? Or maybe you've invested in some. I have, I've, or I haven't invested, but I have looked into them. And I really have considered them a lot. And the the struggle that I have with funds is that it's not as clear cut as investing a specific syndication. And I just like when things are clear cut, right? I like when I can look at a syndication, I can understand this apartment complex, the market, the rents, I have comps I can compare it to. I understand the strategy on this specific building, right? I get it. I'm, I'm just a really logical, mathematical oriented person, I guess. So it just makes sense to me. When I look at a fund, a fund is where there's maybe not a clear enter and exit date, but it kind of is ongoing. They might buy assets throughout. They might sell assets throughout. They have different periods where they're raising money and there's different periods where you can get out of the fund. So there's a lot of these, the problem I have with it, it's, it's harder for me to analyze because it's not like you can just analyze 10 different assets and there's always assets that they're buying and there's assets that they're selling. So it's everything's blended. Um, for that reason, it's it's been harder for me to take the leap on these. But self-storage syndications tend to be funds. So I think in order for me to get invested in self-storage, I'm going to have to invest in a fund. Um, but that's the struggle that I have with that, although I'm sure I'll eventually invest in one. Right. Great. Great feedback. You know, a lot of our folks are you know, maybe looking at uh, syndication, some of them are, you know, actually you know, very experienced, have been doing them for years. Um, what, what kind of advice would you have? I, I'd probably say more for the, the newbie that wants to, wants to get involved, but you know, they're, they're really, really are, are maybe uncertain because again, you know, it really weighs a lot on that sponsor. And if they don't know that person personally, or, um, uh, what, what, what advice would you have for, for somebody that would, you know, so looking at this and I want to, I want to jump into this, but I, I just, I want to do it wisely. Okay. That's a great question. I would say, I know it's easy to feel overwhelmed with this because it's a lot to learn. Just like getting into your first real estate investment deal can be overwhelming. So just start with networking, start with reaching out to real estate investors that, you know, or to other people that are, that might know a syndicator or that are invested in syndications and start to talk to syndicators, start to have conversations with them. You'll start to learn the questions to ask. You'll start to learn the language. I felt a little bit silly starting out because I didn't know the different terms and the different things to say. But the more I started talking to people, the more I learned. Definitely read the book, The Hands-Off Investor, again, by Brian Burke. Um, again, I'm also happy to make intros to any of you for some of the syndicators that I know and trust. But yeah, just don't feel pressured to invest in your first syndication soon. They're not going away. They're going to be there forever. So just get started learning and you'll get there eventually. Great. Great advice, Rachel. Um, and the fact that you've even offered to make introductions is um, is a big deal. And, and I'll uh, I'll uh, double you on that one, too. So if there's folks listening that, uh, that want a referral from somebody that I personally know that is doing a good job, I, I'm open to as well. So, but that is really generous of you to do that. Thank you. Um, and I think that's what it takes. It takes, you know, somebody that you feel comfortable with or in trust. And, um, and even at that, I, I'm going to say to somebody, look, you know, this has been my experience. I, you know, I cannot guarantee to you that, you know, that, that you're going to have the same experience. Um, but, you know, here are the reasons why I think this, you know, and I, and I tend to be really conservative in, in that regard, you know, with people that I know have you know, been, been around for a 
you know, at least, you know, 10, 10 years, maybe 15 years doing this. Um, so, um, and have done it successfully. So, um, I think, uh, I think that's real nice. Thank you the, yeah, for, for course. offering that. Gosh, well, this has been really, really good. Are, are there some, you know, points that we haven't touched on that you think, uh, you know, our listeners need to know about making that transition from active to passive? I, I'm not, I don't know. I would just say, again, don't get caught up in what a syndication projects because anyone can make anything project what they want it to project. And I personally would rather invest with a syndication that projects lower returns. And I'd rather invest with someone who under projects and overperforms. Um, again, do a lot of due diligence on the syndicator and the syndication, but you, you really have to trust the person you're sending that money to um, and just learn, make the most of your network. And it's it's just such a great way to earn passive income. So I'm, I'm really excited and I hope you all are too after listening to this. Uh, awesome. And, and, and one last question here. Um, with syndications, you know, we're, we're where inflation is like all time high right now, the the economy is is you know questionable. We still have COVID out there. Um, uh, how would you? I know you invest in other things besides real estate, but I, I don't know if you still do or not. But I know that you did. And um, you know, how would you rank syndications in uncertain times like this? Oh, I think real estate in general is a great place to put your money when inflation is high. You know, a lot of people are asking me, it's 2022, the real estate market is crazy right now, Rachel, is now even a good time to invest? And I think absolutely it's a good time to invest. Um, with uh, housing specifically, I believe, and I'm not an economist, so take this with a grain of salt, but I believe it's a supply and demand issue, not a bubble, right? That bubbles are driven by fear and a lot of nothing. A supply and demand issue means that if you look at the graphs of the houses built in the U.S. by decade, there were hardly any houses built in 2010s. And there's still a lot of people that need housing and the population continues to grow. So it's really a supply and demand problem that's driving the housing market up. And I don't I think that could take years to correct. Sure, we could have a market correction, but it's it's just a big problem right now in the economy. So there's that inflation is high. It was at 7% in December. One of the best places to keep your money in times of inflation is in real assets like land and real estate. And again, the way I invest in real estate is I invest for cash flow, not for appreciation. I think that's the smarter way and the more conservative way to invest. And if you invest for in a cash flowing asset, it's not going to matter what happens when the, when the market goes down because the cash flowing asset will make it through a down market. If you invest for appreciation, then in a down market, you're going to lose your money. So I think it's all about how you invest in this market and how conservative you can be. But I do think that investing in real estate and syndications is one of the best things you can do with your money. Great, great point. Yeah, I I, I definitely say, I mean, even in, in the toughest of times, people are still going to need a roof over their head. So uh, as far as like multifamily and, and that kind of thing, I, I think it's just, it's about as solid as you can get. I, I probably would would kind of lean against, you know, luxury properties. Um, but, um, I would, uh, at the same time, you know, there's, there's a lot of great B properties out there and, um, that, uh, I, I probably feel more comfortable with, but I, I think that that, uh, yeah, that's really, really good point. Uh, well, Rachel, this has been so cool having you on again. Um, man, oh man, you always have such good stuff to say. Well, I'm sure, you know, there's folks out there that, uh, want to find out more about your, your, you know, everything you're doing and you're doing a lot of stuff out there. I mean, your books are going crazy. You're speaking all over the country. You're, you're, you know, you're on all over the media and TV and radio and all that. Um, how can people find out about you, your books and, and, uh, um, you know, what, what, what you're up to and uh, Hey, if they want to ask for a referral on a syndication <laughs> too, on top of it. Yeah, thanks, Bill. So both of my books, Money, Honey, and Passive Income Aggressive Retirement are available on Amazon. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Money, Honey, Rachel. For those of you who would like a syndication introduction, email me at rachel at moneyhoneyrachel.com. 
And then lastly, what I would love to do for your listeners is if anyone wants to download my passive income starter kit, I will give that for free. So you can go to moneyhoneyrachel.com slash passive income to download that. How cool is that? That is so cool. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, Rachel, thank you so much for being on. And, uh, you know, it just wouldn't be the same to close the show out without you giving us your best old, uh, you know, Denver howl, you know? I mean, <laughs> you got wolves out there, don't you? Or something? I know. I need to practice this time. So this is just going to, I'm going to go for it. Okay, ready? <laughs> you got it. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> How was that? That was good. That was good. (laughs) Thank you. You you passed the test. (laughs) Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being on. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. That's always so much fun. And I hope it was helpful. I hope you have an amazing rest of the day. Good stuff. Good stuff. We, I will have a great day here now after this. Uh, I also want to thank all our old dog listeners out there too, for joining us. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to join us means a lot and we really appreciate it. Uh, please note everything Rachel talked about. There's a lot of good meat in here. There's links to books, her books, uh, some books that she read uh, on passive income and, and so and so um, that can all be accessed in our detailed show notes on the old dog's website website at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog and you're going to uh, look for the episode with uh, Rachel Richards so thank you so much uh, for listening everybody Uh, remember cash flow is king and real estate investing the means until next time keep moving forward and may God bless thank you very much for visiting the old dogs REI network we would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.